Oops. Screen sharing. <laughs> Thank you for my cell phone screen sharing. Awesome. Hello, everybody. I thought that was our theme song. This is our theme song. Uh, so I'm not going to sing. Uh, <laughs> hi, everyone. Welcome to this week's Learning Space. My name is Nicole Gallucci. I am your co-host from Cosmo Quest. I am sometimes called the postdoc with the most rock. <laughs> uh, through the wall is my co-host, <laughs> Georgia Bracey. Hello. I know. I'm just over there. Just through the wall. Through the wall. Through the wall. Yeah. Stop that. Sorry. <laughs> that was going to be a little silly today. Apologies in advance. And we are joined by Cosmo Academy Director, Matthew Francis. Dr. Matthew. Oh, I'm going to say it. <laughs> I'm going to be nice and not screw up your Twitter handle. I was going to say, you, I, I was expecting you to do what, what, Fraser, what Fraser always does and say, and it's Dr. Matthew Francis. <laughs> it's Dr. Globular Francis. <laughs> it goes by many names, apparently. <laughs> no, I just like to make fun of everything Fraser says. And I won't tell you the nickname I picked up at a restaurant a few weeks ago. Please do. Now you have to. I know. That sounds like an interesting story. The the waitress was regaling us with tales about how creepy guys tried to pick her up, so she gave us all creepy nicknames, and mine was Gumdrop. <laughs> 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 so she called you know she she called the woman sitting next to me a little lady, and then I forget what she called you know, what she called the other, but it was like we all picked up creepy nicknames. So. Yeah, this might stick. <laughs> <laughs> Doctor Gumdrop. <laughs> oh man. All right, so we have a couple of interesting topics this week, but first I would like to say welcome to everybody. Um, if you would like to comment, uh, please use the Q&A app anywhere where you're watching this. If it's YouTube, it's, if it's on Google+, Plus, if it's embedded somewhere, you should be able to click on join the conversation. Um, that will take you to the Q&A app where you can send us your questions and comments. Um, I apologize for the reflective glasses. It's bothering me. It must be bothering, I don't know if it's bothering you, but allergies. Therefore, no contacts. So, bah. Um, we have some comments, and Guido already beat us to it. <laughs> Happy birthday, Nancy Graziano. Yeah. Yay. Birthday, girl. Welcome. <laughs> Happy birthday, Nancy. Um, yes, Nancy Graziano, who was helping us out just at uh, last week. A little over a week ago at Balticon, where CosmoQuest had a table, and we were recruiting new citizen scientists from the sci-fi fantasy convention that is Balticon, and you guys came out and helped us, which is awesome. Nancy's also responsible for free formatting all of the Cards Against Astronomy cards that you sick, wonderful people <laughs> helped us create. You can now print them on index cards. This is great. You stick index cards in your printer. As long as you teach your computer what an in size an index card is, you can print all of these cards against astronomy cards um, and, and play with them better than the tiny paper squares that um, yeah. comes standard. Yeah, are those 3 by 5 or 4 by 6 3 by 5 index oh. cards, yes. And there are two versions. There is one where you can print two on a card and cut them. Um, and then there's, the, I, I printed the economy version, the economy ink version, which for the black cards, instead of, bl I, I pick a, I, I get colored index cards, and this, this idea I totally stole from the Cards Against Science people, so check that out too. Um, all these games are available for free, obviously, because it's all under the Creative Commons license. Um, and, uh, yeah, th so, uh, there's one version where this whole outline is in black, just like the black cards in the original game, or the ink economy version, because ink is so expensive that just has the label in black, so that was totally clever. It looks good. Yeah. So I'm excited to share that and play that, and so thank you, Nancy, for, for doing that for us. Um... Let's see, what else? We have highs and hellos, <laughs> Lance and Michael and Nancy and Brandon and Guido. So, yeah, and Nancy says we need to install a window in the wall. Georgia does not want to watch me. <laughs> <laughs> Only if we can open the window and pass the music back in my wall. head while I work, basically. That would be helpful. That would be helpful. I think, well, that's why we have Google Hangouts, is we message each other through the I know, but then physically, you know, I don't know. We could make use of that. We could, we could. <laughs> I'll have a weekend project sometime. My, yes. Nobody's here. Yes, sure, why not? 
I am here on the weekend occasionally. All well, right, so first up, we're talking about uh, the general theme. We'll be talking about some uh, learning experiences for lifelong learners. So first we'll be talking about uh, how you can learn cool astronomy stuff with Cosmo Academy, and then we'll be talking some about summer learning opportunities for teachers. Mm -hmm. But we brought Matthew Francis on here to talk about Cosmo Academy. So do you want to give a brief overview of what Cosmo Academy is? Well, Cosmo Academy is uh, basically what we're trying to do is be kind of the the anti MOOC. The you know instead of signing up for a class where you're in with maybe hundreds or thousands of other people. What is MOOC? What is MOOC? MOOC massive open online class okay. or course? I forget what the C stands for, but. Uh, you, you've seen names like Khan Academy and a lot of universities run these now. But there are classes that are, uh, you, you have almost no, virtually no contact with any other students. You have no contact with the instructors. Mm -hmm. um, you may have hundreds or thousands of fellow students. Um, and the only thing they really have going for them in terms of learning is low or no cost. So um, so they can be fun, they can be rewarding, but you don't really get a chance to learn about topics in a small setting. You don't get to ask questions. Most people who sign up for MOOCs never finish them. Um, our classes are small. They're limited to eight students per, per section. Sometimes we offer more than one section. Um, you actually can interact with the instructors. If you take a class from me, you actually talk to me, and I talk to you. Um, maybe that's not a positive thing, but you, who knows? Um, it's cool. <laughs> um, but I mean, you can get you 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 want to you want to talk about you, you get me started talking about black holes. It's the hard part is getting me to stop. So this is a chance to talk black holes with with me and learn about them. Um, with people who are similarly interested. We, uh, most of our classes require no prior knowledge. Mm -hmm. um, we have a few slated, we have a few that have a little bit higher skill level, like ones that require some knowledge of computer software. But most of our classes require no particular prior knowledge. You don't have to have, uh, you know, degrees. You don't have to have, you know, don't have to have a college education. You know, we, we expect that if you can look at an equation that is no more complicated than one you might see in a high school class, you're good without without screaming and running away. You know, that's that's as that's as exciting as it gets. Um, but we cover topics in depth um, that might not be more than 20 minutes of an astronomy 101 class. Mm -hmm. If you take a if you take a a college class or a, or you know community college class on astronomy, um, black holes will be there, but they probably won't be more than a few minutes of the class. Um, whereas if you take a class with us, you get four hours of black holes. Mm -hmm. We can really talk about what black hole research is about. You know, we, we can talk about, you know, why black holes are, are not just this crazy idea, you know, how black holes actually shape galaxies that they inhabit. We can talk about how we know they exist, even though the, the, at first blush they might seem to be utterly invisible. You know, we talk about that sort of thing. We talk about what gra what the laws of gravity say about them. Um, that's the black holes class. We've also offered classes on radio astronomy. That we have another one coming up um, in a few weeks, um, specifically on. It, it's it's not just radio astronomy. It's zooming in on what we can learn from 21 centimeter emission. Okay, 21 centimeter emission is, okay, so here's my ruler. I always have to bring this one out. Okay, that is a wave that repeats itself over that much of a distance. Okay, that's the kind of light that's emitted by neutral hydrogen atoms. Okay, so just plain old hydrogen, one proton, one electron. That's the most common stuff atoms in the universe. So there's a lot of neutral hydrogen out there. So that's 
a specific, so we can devote an entire class to that. What can we learn about it? And, and our instructor, um, Catherine Williamson, it works for National Radio Astronomy Observatory, NRAO. Um, she is going to provide, hopefully, a little bit of a tour from one of the telescopes that's on site at Green Bank. Um, there's all sorts of things we can do in a class like this. So that's an exciting one coming up at the end of this month. So I hope you'll consider looking into that one as well. So we've got classes that are a little more theory-oriented, like the black holes. We've got classes that are a little more about what, what, how do we see the stuff we want to see, mm -hmm. that kind of class. And then we've got a third class, a third type of class, which is how do we turn, um, how do we turn data into pretty pictures? Because we all love to look at those pretty pictures, but that's not what comes out of the telescope. So that's a, that's a, that's a third category of class. So we can offer all sorts of things, really awesome stuff. And I would think with the small group of students that you have, that even once you get into a topic, um, you can kind of take the class almost any way your students might want to go, right? If you're, you've got some students yeah. with a particular interest or particular issues they've heard of or current events, I mean, a lot of flexibility, right? Exactly. Um, I particularly start every class with a, have you heard any news within the last few days? And with something like, you know, a lot of the topics we cover, the answer is yes. <laughs> Yep. Yeah, the, when I was teaching the Life Beyond Earth class, uh, Craig yes. Landon, one of the participants, pointed out that at the same if I had known this, I would have pushed the class a couple weeks later, but at the same time, there was a conference going on about the search for life in the universe, search for life in the galaxy. Yeah. Um, and I would have, if I had known that, I probably would have pushed the class later so that that whole conference could have ended and we could have used all the information, but because the entire conference was recorded, all the videos were recorded, we, we were able to watch a couple of the presentations, and then discuss them in class. And so that was happening right at that time. Oh, wow, perfect. So yeah, there's the Black Holes class that Matthew's showing. So when does this one start? This one starts, um, i got to check the, <laughs> kind of remember the actual start date. <laughs> um, the start date, let me scroll down. Magic. Magic. Start date is June 16th. Okay, and you've got two sections. So that's... Uh, Two sections, early, uh, early-ish. Um, uh, that's an experiment. We have not tried that sort of thing before. So, um, those of you who are in Europe, maybe that time would be a little more acceptable mm -hmm. than starting after midnight your local time, um, <laughs> which is what our, our evening classes tend to be. Time. I was so impressed, but yes. <laughs> Yeah, actually, that's yep. part of the reason we moved this show earlier, was for <laughs> the European audience as well. Yeah. Okay, yeah. so that's good. So there's two sections of that, and then there's one section of the... the I'm so excited for the 21 centimeter class. So Karen and I did not... Yeah, this should be fun. ...did not overlap at the NRAO, unfortunately, because <laughs> she's awesome. Catherine, Catherine um, I think I must have met her through a conference... Um, but she does outreach, uh, public education outreach at NRAO. So that class starts July 2nd. She is also one of the astronomy ambassadors. Um, we did a show from AAS back in January. So she was one of the astronomy ambassadors that was on that show. Um, so she's really cool, really excited, really awesome to learn from. So I'm thrilled that uh, you guys have that starting up. I don't know how the tour is going to work since there's no Wi-Fi at Green Bank. But... <laughs> Well, again, we'll have to see how that works. Um, yeah. Certainly, she's going to be sharing some data from one of the telescopes. Definitely, definitely, um, definitely. She was kind of hoping to be able to let the students use the telescope, but I think that it's not time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They do that for the summer students often, occasionally, the uh, summer undergraduate research assistants. Um, but they plan; they have to plan it months in advance. So, but now we know. <laughs> yeah. Awesome, awesome. Um, and Would then cosmoacademy.org. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry. Yeah, cosmoacademy.org. That'll take you to cosmoacademy.org, and uh, which is under my name on the video screen. Um, that's where you can find the links to all of our classes. We've got a couple more coming up. Hopefully, um, we've got another class on studying. Um, 
small bodies in the solar system, asteroids and comets, um, that hopefully will be coming up before the end of summer. Stay tuned for that. Um, forget what else we've got possibly lined up. So. Awesome. And in uh, the many, many good things. Right. Sandy Springman taught one about asteroids. Sandy Springman, our resident asteroid just ended. Asteroid, so, yeah. Yes. <laughs> Excellent. Tell me, Dr. Matthew Francis, do black holes suck? <laughs> no. <laughs> black that, holes. That is what that's, you that's, 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 that's always the. Oh, I should have, I should have brought that. I, I made a I made a meme before memes were a thing, of <laughs> Butthead from Beavis and Butthead saying black holes suck, and uh, the caption says Butthead is wrong. Um, <laughs> there, there's sort of there's sort of the idea that if you have a black hole, everything is going to get sucked into it, mm -hmm. but actually black holes uh, work through normal gravity admittedly much stronger version of normal gravity but the black hole at the center of the Milky Way if you if you took it away the Sun would just follow its normal path around the galactic center um, so in, in fact there are stars orbiting the central black hole in the Milky Way that's that's a really beautiful image and animation that 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 uh, researchers have made um, those stars are following perfectly normal stable orbits around this black hole not getting sucked in at all um, that isn't to say that some stuff doesn't fall in mm -hmm. and that's something that astronomers study extensively to try to learn how black holes behave um, and all this stuff is part of the class <laughs> it's not already a t-shirt was that now black holes don't suck should be a t-shirt oh yes <laughs> yes we should make one I had to grab this pull up this one that I used as a blog post <laughs> <laughs> one more time because people just love throwing around that acronym um, in fact I was at a conference and somebody said it and couldn't remember what it stood for they're like massive online ook <laughs> um, <laughs> not to discount MOOCs I actually just started one uh, one of the coding ones from Harvard and um, which is great because there's a local meetup attached to it so I can meet up with the local meetup people and actually do a thing so it's it's totally cool. It's just a very different environment from what we have going in the in the hangouts. Yeah, but that's what kind of keeps a lot of people engaged. Is there some sort of you know yeah. actual face to face or at least you know more localized you know interaction? So it's not just you're looking at some video or lecture from way far away. You know, there's more there's more to it that keeps you excited about it and a chance to talk and discuss things. So. Yes, yeah, so small class or a small version of a class is a really good thing. Yep. Yeah. So, Matthew, I have a question about more about what goes on in the classes, too. And I, I imagine they're all different a little bit depending on who's teaching them. Um, and maybe you can talk a little bit about that. But um, So there's, there's discussion and maybe tours of telescopes and things like that. Are there things like projects and homework and assigned readings and... All that good stuff. <laughs> it depends on the class. Um, depends on the class, yeah. It, it, it really does depend on the class. Yeah. The, the ones that are involved with making images mm -hmm. are very project oriented. Yeah. The idea is that you should be able to learn how to do this yourself. Um, I have done, you know, kind of, I've, I've done kind of short report assignments mm -hmm. for homework. I've done some simple oh. calculation assignments. Did you have um, presentations? I think I think I went to that the, one of the yeah. first. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, the first one I, I did do a presentation for the shorter classes that we've been doing since. There's not much time, so I've 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 dropped that. Mm -hmm. um, if if we did a longer class, I might bring that back. But uh, we're yeah. we're the ones we've been doing recently have been four hours long, and if you have eight students in the class and each do a five-minute presentation, then you know how, uh, one quarter of the class is gone, the entire class I've signed up for. So, And also there's very little time for them to think about their projects and put one together. Yeah. So, um, so pre for presentations. Um, so that doesn't mean that it'll never happen. It's just that, yeah, there's limits to what we can do in the format as well. Yeah, but, uh, yeah. We've done it. I had them, yeah, watch a couple of uh, lectures 
that were happening that that week um, at a conference. Uh, conference yeah. and we had a, just just a whole discussion section on those two lectures. That's um, so that, that's the kind of thing that I do. Because yeah, like I said, it's it's a four hours. It's over the course of two weeks. Um, so I don't want to bombard them, and that's so that's usually the kind of assignments that I give. And, and also, I I have I, I'll send them out. I'll send students out to hunt down news stories. Yes. So. As well. Yeah. So, all right. Anything else about Cosmo Academy? People, things people should know. Hmm. Let me think. Uh. Do you take? I think if there's anything important. For, do you take suggestions for new courses? Yes. Ideas. Things people want to know about. Yes. <laughs> we will definitely take suggestions. Um, the only the, the limitation, of course, is if we have an instructor who can who can handle that. Yes. Like right. if you want a class on Saturn, we would love to offer a class on Saturn, but we need to Shanghai somebody, somebody to teach it, of course. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, because anything smaller than a galaxy, I don't know much about. So, uh, well, black holes, but yeah. Um, Solar system is a, is not my area, so um, we would need to find somebody who knows something about the topic. But that's another good thing about these classes is we do have experts in particular in these particular areas. And if you are an expert in a particular so. area or no one who might be interested in teaching a class on this line, if they're not already overwhelmed, yeah, <laughs> I was gonna, yeah, I was gonna say about Talk half my friends come back with, ah, oh, I'm already overwhelmed, but uh, we've we've pulled a bunch of people out of um. Who do have have uh, some spare time to work on a class like this, and so that. that yep. is. Uh, we have a question about black holes from Daniel. Uh, do okay. like, do black holes connect with other black holes in galaxies? Is it a mesh network of holes? If you look at it on a larger scale. Uh, probably not. Simply because the the math that we have that would allow black holes to connect with each other, um, that's that's we, you, you've run we've all run across those. They're wormholes, is what they're called, or sometimes Einstein Rosen bridges. If you want to be, oh, let's be snooty about it. <laughs> um, but it's uh, it's uh, um, th those are those are are allowed within the structure of of the theory, but. It, they only exist in the abstract because if, as soon as you drop anything into a wormhole, it collapses. Mm -hmm. So um, there was this story that made me tear what little hair I have left out a couple weeks ago. They were saying, oh, the, the, the black hole, the center of the Milky Way is actually a wormhole, um, uh, which is, it's like, yeah, well, that's fine, but unless you have a, an entirely new theory which is not supported by evidence so far, um, there's no way to make a black hole a bridge to anywhere but oblivion. Um, it's just not, you know, there, there's no way to make it anything other than an endpoint, a collapse. So, bridge to oblivion. It's a cool idea story. I know. It sounds like <laughs> exciting. So no Stargate. One way ticket though. Basically, we don't know of <laughs> whether it's possible to have this. Like um, that's what I think of when I think of network of black holes. I think Stargate. It's a great sci-fi. I usually think contact. Or contact. Mm, okay. Oh, yeah. Sorry, but you're right. Contact too. Spoiler alert. Oh, by the way, that's that's yeah. actually a cool that's actually a cool story. Uh, Carl Sagan wanted a way to get people from one part of the universe, one part of the galaxy to another without any time go without any time passing, and so he called up Kip Thorne, who is a a gravitational theorist, and and Thorne worked out you know what a what a wormhole would be like, and so basically they turned this this abstract idea from from the theory of gravity into something for for science fiction, and the, the rest is is uh, history, I guess. Yeah. So awesome. Uh, we got a question actually. Uh, Brandon Stroop asked, "Where can I print those cards?" Meaning the cards against astronomy. Uh, and then Nancy uh, replied back, but I will uh, say this for the listeners and viewers as well. Uh, the cards are available in numerous formats at a link at CosmoQuest, which is up on the screen now, but you can also go to cardsagainstastronomy.com and it will take you right there. 
um, because I randomly buy interesting right. domain names. <laughs> <laughs> and a year later, we finally use them. So yeah, cardsagainstastronomy.com will take you there quickly. Um, if you're on Cosmo Quest, there's a section called Space Play where we're starting to post all the science games that we have been trying to work on. So that's where you can print them. Um, and then in, in the Education tab at CosmoQuest, you can see Cosmo Academy, Space Play, Educator Zone, all of the different ways that you can learn or help others learn about science. So, yeah, cool. All right, I think we are going to transition to talking about uh, teaching oppor or learning opportunities for teachers. Mm -hmm. Matthew, if you want to stay or go, it's up to you. I think I will probably vanish, but feel free to <laughs> drop me email. Um, you can find me on Twitter at Dr. M. R. Francis. Dr. Mr. Francis. Um, <laughs> yes. <laughs> I have to say that so, so that Nicole can make her joke. Um, let's see. And, of course, cosmoacademy.org mm -hmm. for all of your online, well, some of your online learning needs. <laughs> for your astronomical right. Thank you all. See you later, Matthew. Thanks, Matthew. Bye. <laughs> Yay. So whenever somebody asks me a cosmology question and I say, I don't know, I'm usually going off to ask either him <laughs> or Brian <laughs> to our weekly space hangout. Good to have resources. It's good to know people. Yeah, they're good so. with the not, not as good at the, the big seal cosmology stuff. <laughs> um, oh, uh, we have, oh, he just left as we've got another black hole question. <gasps> Well, from Lan. I'll have to ask. <clears throat> so after mentioning the black hole at the center of the Milky Way, it made me consider the eventual collision of Andromeda, which also likely has a black hole. That's true. Uh, what would be the results of a collision between two black holes, and how would it happen? A bigger black hole! Um, so this we have seen happen in galaxy collisions. Um, as the galaxies come together, the stars don't collide because there's so much space between the stars, but the gas clouds do collide, and a lot of the gas kind of funnels into the centers of these galaxies. And so the black holes become active because they have a whole lot of material falling onto them. Not getting sucked in, but falling onto them. <laughs> and then eventually the two black holes will get closer and closer and spiral and spiral around each other and merge to make a larger black hole. And that's how we think um, these million and billion solar mass black holes grew to be that size in the centers of all these galaxies. Uh, and when they are spiraling around each other very closely, we think they're giving off gravitational waves. And so that's something that a lot of gravitational wave detectors are being built to detect. But we've also seen it with radio telescopes to black holes in, in fairly close orbit around each other in merging galaxies. So there's a black hole question I can answer. <laughs> okay, excellent. So when you say larger black hole or bigger black hole, you mean more massive? More massive, oh, right. Okay. Well, it's more massive, and then by default, because the Schwarzschild radius, the size of the event horizon, is related to the mass, it gets plumper. You know, it's it's it's. Full. <laughs> so that radius actually gets bigger. I couldn't yeah. remember the name of the guy. Sorry. Yeah, the Schwarzschild funny. radius gets bigger, yeah. and the mass gets bigger. So you get all oh, you get a bigger black hole. Uh, well, we have that. Well, somebody has that to look forward to, and. I know, five billion years from now. Billion years. It's gonna be awesome. We're gonna have. We're probably gonna have active gal active black holes. They're gonna merge. It's gonna be great. <sighs> so much fun. Great. The universe is an exciting place. Yeah. Let's face yeah. it. All right. So let's uh, transition to talking about. Although I could talk about black holes all day. If you want to talk about black holes all day, check out Matthew's class. We are going to talk about learning opportunities for teachers, uh, particularly over the summer. And I couldn't find a link, uh, but I, I had seen this getting passed around. It was from a website. It was either The Onion or something like The Onion, where the headline was a, a very snarky, uh, students shocked to find that teachers work over the summer. <laughs> <laughs> and and as, a, as a teacher, Georgia, you understand that. Because you know you don't necessarily get all the um, all that time off. The three months, the classic, right? Yeah. What's the best? What are the three best things about teaching? June, July, August. Yeah. To be um, the old joke in a way, but yeah, not really that much anymore. Um, teachers have always had a little bit of time, depending on your district and how your um, school year is structured um, in the summer, but it's not always such an easygoing, you know, relaxing time as many people would like to think. So, um, and sometimes it's, you know, tasks that are related to your uh, district, you know, things that you're involved with, you know, committee meetings, um, writing curriculum, maybe teaching summer school, you know, there's things that are going on 
in most school districts um, over the summer. And so a lot of teachers stay involved and do things so they don't get this long, lovely, expansive time. But many people um, are experiencing, you know, longer school years, um, school years that stop for a little bit, three weeks on, three weeks off. So, you know, there's a lot of different variations out there on how, you know, the old traditional summer looks these days. So, but if you're lucky enough to still have some, a nice chunk of time, um, there's a lot of great things you can do with that time. So um, I know when I first started teaching, what I did with my time was just sort of recover uh, from the school year because I, that's just all I remember about my first few years. It's like, woo, I made it through, yes, and now I'm going to recoup, recover, uh, take a break for the summer. Um, so, you know, that might be the scenario for, you know, some people and for first, maybe first and second year teachers. But, um, you know, with that time, there's all kinds of amazing things that you can do with it if you are so inclined. So um, one of them, of course, is just some type of professional development. So if there's a particular um, thing that either you or maybe your district is encouraging you to learn about, um, you can go to all kinds of places to find um, that kind of learning experience. So sometimes it's a local university like here at SIUV and the STEM Center. Uh, we put on a variety of professional development kinds of things. Um, sometimes they're very small and focused like just this Saturday um, we had a small professional development session for local teachers on how to use vernier probes. So sometimes it's mm -hmm. centered around just you know some particular piece of technology or some curriculum. It can be very focused that way. Um, but also we do longer things. We do um, multiple year professional development sessions, oftentimes um, involved with a grant of some sort and with other experiences attached to just a classroom experience. So teachers might come out and um, learn about something for a couple weeks. They might have projects they're working on and then that might extend into their school year time where they take what they've learned in the summer and try it in their classroom, develop some things to use over the school year, and then come back the following summer and sort of uh, take a look at what happened, how it went, and, and learn more. So um, it can be anything from, yeah, so very short and focused to longer experiences in the summer. Um, and your local university uh, might be a good place to start if you're searching for different kinds of learning experiences in the summer. Um, but there's also, I guess we should talk about NSTA, National Science Teachers Association. They have um, lots of online um, professional development, webinars and things like that. But if you are a member of that organization, um, you can get on their list serves. And what I've seen, and especially you know, in the spring, things really gear up. Um, you start to see all these wonderful posts. You know, here's this opportunity in this part of the country um, for a great trip or a great class over the summer for teachers. And you just—they're not necessarily connected with NSTA, but the members all across the country hear about great things and they post them on these listservs. So. Um, you can just go to the basic NSTA list um, or website and get on their listservs there and uh, find out about all kinds of great opportunities. Yeah, I think we 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 published we posted about our uh, workshops, our CosmoQuest workshops on there as well. Um, I used to be I'm, I'm yeah. not currently an NSTA member. I've kind of lapsed, <laughs> uh, but I was on those for a while. Um, it's yeah, it's, it's not necessarily centralized, but it is a good place to post your own opportunity as well as learning about opportunities going on near you. Um, <clears throat> yeah, and you can ask too. You can throw out a question, say, "I'm in this part of the country. I'm looking for something on you know the new science standards or." Um, I just have an interest in geology and does anybody know of anything going on in the summer, you know, that would pertain to that and you will get answers. <laughs> you will get help. Oh. That's the great thing about those listservs. Uh, Kurt Godwin comments about at the school district, he's a school district network administrator. And he can attest to the fact that teachers work over the summer. And in particular, he quotes, so when can I take the network down for maintenance? And they say, well, the teachers are here until 9 p.m., so after that. <laughs> so There's an example of teachers working really late hours um, and using the computer resources to plan ahead for the next thing. Um, yeah. So, sorry, I hope, I hope, ooh, you have some late night work hours in that case. <laughs> 
I know. There's never a good time to take the network down. Take the network down. Let me tell you, there's just, I'm sure he knows, there's no good time. Um, so can you tell us a little bit, so I know you had some cool experiences um, at, with summer professional development. Would you mind telling us a little I bit know. about so it? After I got, you know, a few years into teaching and I wanted to do more than just chill out and veg for the summer, um, I started to, you know, you start to get networks going of people that hear about these things. So a lot of times um, you will just word of mouth hear about, you know, this great program starting. Um, here's a great travel experience over here and you might want to jump into that. Um, so I did start to hear about more and more of these great summer opportunities and so of course my interest being science, you know, all the ones I can tell about are definitely science related and in particular um, astronomy and um, meteorology, so I love the weather and I even had one that had some geology in there. Um, so I've thought back and yeah there's a few that really stick in my mind that were really cool. Um, a couple are still going on but not all of them. So the first one that I did was through the AAS, the American Astronomical Society, which we're familiar. Um, they used to have a program, this one's not going anymore, um, I'm pretty sure, um, somebody can correct me if I'm wrong, but I'm pretty sure this one's over. Um, this is uh, the American Astronomical Society Teacher Resource Agent, oh, if I've got that right, A-A-S-T-R-A, -A -A, another great acronym. Yes, <laughs> and um, so this was, again, this was a longer summer opportunity. Um, it went for um, many years, and I'm not even sure how long it went for. I was involved um, for one year, and this was um, where, depending on where you were in the um, United States, a local university would host um, some of this, and you would go down and you would take about three weeks in the summer, um, with a lot of other local teachers who were also interested and you would stay, um, we stayed in the dorms at Loyola University, which is a lot of fun at this point, this was in Chicago, um, and you would learn a lot of good astronomy, again a lot of current event kind of stuff, plus you would also learn um, activities that you could take back into your classroom, so we did a lot of Project Astros, Astro stuff. Um, and you would uh, do visits, local visits, so um, Yerkes University was not too far away um, from where we were, so that was a place that we went to. Um, so it's just this great combination of um, learning new topics um, and more about topics in astronomy, um, meeting lots of other teachers that also had similar interests, and so you would get a great network going. Um, and then visiting local areas around you, so um, you know you learned more about what resources were available um, just in the area. And then often there were um, university professors that were involved and would either be involved with the whole thing or just at least be coming in and giving sort of a guest lecture type of thing. Um, and those people uh, became great resources as well. So if you went back to the classroom and you had a question, um, you know, you had somebody that you could contact. So just the combination of, um, you know, personal learning, um, learning about something that you as um, an instructor were interested in and wanted to know more about, plus getting more ideas for the classroom, plus just meeting other people um, that were also interested in your favorite topic, you know, that combination made a really powerful experience and something that was very memorable and the other cool thing was this happened in 1994, the summer of 1994, where Comet Shoemaker-Levy 9 plowed into Jupiter, or many pieces of that comet plowed into Jupiter, and that was going on at the same time. So like you guys and Matthew just talked about, you know, current events that happen during these things just, you know, make it even more exciting and memorable. So I remember us being all, all going crazy about that. And this was before, you know, I mean, the internet was there, but, you know, the, the devices were not all, you know, like we have them today. And so it was like scrambling trying to find an actual TV where we could watch some of the coverage of this because, you know, you didn't have like, computers and internet, but just stuff wasn't just readily broadcasted as quickly like it is today. 
over a variety of media. So um, that was that was kind of cool and very memorable. And then um, the other thing about this program is it's what you hear more now called train the trainer. So mm -hmm. the teachers were there. We were learning all this great stuff. You know, more astronomy content, more activities. Um, and then part of what we had to do once we were all finished was to go back to our districts and um, create um, teaching and learning opportunities for people there and for our students there. So, of course, we would um, implement a lot of activities we learned in the classroom, but we would also um, have like star parties for parents, um, family science nights. So we had to sort of you know, share the knowledge back at our local district and our local town. So, um, and then we would also teach our other um, instructors and teachers that were in our building. So, um, so things just sort of got disseminated that way. So that was a very exciting, um, very exciting program. And I know, I'm not sure, now you're doing the Astronomy Ambassadors, right? And I know that's through AAS? That's for... Um, oh, that's a little different, right? That's for scientists, yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. Okay. Grad students, postdocs, and, and so I was poking yeah. around on the website, the AAS, just to see if there was still anything lingering from this old program, and I didn't see anything, but I saw that and I remembered. Well, that that's the thing. Oh, we're, we're doing we're that one, but that's a little different. Yeah. yeah, we were discussing a bit before the show. Um, is that uh, because of the way funding goes up and down, sometimes, um, the same programs aren't permanent, so they'll do it for a few years, and then the funding runs out, and then people will move on to something else and find funding for a different project. So there are lots yeah, of that, um, yes, that's related exactly opportunities, but not the same. What happens, program. unfortunately, right? So yeah, they're always thinking of sustainability and how to keep um, things going, and even, you know, ideally if the grant or the program itself, you know, doesn't last forever, but still the the experiences and the networking, hopefully. Um, the resources, the knowledge will keep sort of, you know, rippling outward. <laughs> right. The same people work on different yeah. projects. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Um, so you, you mentioned uh, just paying attention to local universities, word of mouth, uh, the NSTA listservs, anything else for finding? Um, um, yeah, different associations and, you know, the one nice thing about the summer stuff is it gives teachers a chance to focus on something that they are really interested in. So. Mm -hmm. Depending on you know your grade level and your district, and you know, oftentimes you find yourself teaching um, things that you know maybe you're just not comfortable with, but maybe just aren't your favorite thing either. And and that changes, and that's a part of a lot of teaching. But in the summer, it's always cool because you can sort of focus on what you really would like to learn more about. And so, if for example it is astronomy, you know. Um, just start looking for different astronomy associations because even things, you know, like typically like, you know, the AAS is, you think, yeah, just for scientists, just for astronomers, but most um, associations like that, they have an education, you know, arm, I guess, if you want to call it that, or an outreach section, and so there, just by going to websites and, and digging around a little bit, usually they offer some kind of uh, course or summer experience. Um, for example, the Geological Society of America, the GSA, they have um, summer trips for teachers. They have um, workshops that they sponsor. So again, if you you know if geology is more your thing, then you know you can go there and see what they have. They have trips. I know they've got one um, to Hawaii. They have one to Mammoth Caves in Kentucky, which I've been to. It's fabulous, um, and most of these, I think they're going to do the Hawaii trip again next year, um, but you know, at this point, it's too late to sort of apply for these. But um, be thinking about next year. So I would say, you know, whatever your interest is, um, look for some of these bigger organizations because they will be sponsoring a lot of these uh, kinds of experiences and trips. Um, NSTA is also good again. Um, you know, if not, if they're not offering something themselves, it's usually a place where you can ask and, you know, find out what's going on close to you. Sure, yeah. Um, other thing I think of is uh, local science centers and science museums. Um, I know the... Yeah. The, yeah. Uh, 
I don't remember which one I've been to, but um, but uh, a lot of these uh, centers like that will have professional development or workshops for teachers as well. Uh, yes, so yeah, museums side. definitely do, um, and then even a little more locally, um, usually there's a local sort of uh, or regional office of education of some sort. Um, that encompasses, you know, several school districts within an area of a state. And a lot of times they'll be offering um, usually smaller and more focused workshops and mm -hmm. things. But again, um, a good place to start to see if there's anything that you need or are interested in. Well, what I've discovered about science museums, I, I think it was uh, one in North Carolina, they gave us a tour out, uh, before Science Online one year, and <laughs> Science museums, like the stuff you see on display, is a tiny, tiny fraction of all the specimens they actually have to study and work with. And so I think some of these programs will actually give you that background tour of like, here's the pretty things on display, and then like in the basement or in some other like in interior hallway, there's all the specimens that they use for study, and so you can kind of get a glimpse of, of that world as well. For like you know, what's even cooler is that a lot of museums do overnights or even multiple overnights, and there's nothing cooler than camping out on the floor of a big museum at night. They did that one, this was actually in the winter, it was over a winter break, but my fellow teachers and I, we went to um, Science and Industry Museum in Chicago, and they were doing an overnight, and it's, you got to just, of course, have the museum to yourself. Um, we bother! I know, and you bring your, um, bring your sleeping bag, and you could pick your favorite, you know, exhibit to sleep near, and it was, and then, yeah, you get to see a lot of the behind-the-scenes stuff, which is just really cool, and, you know, I think what's really important for these summer experiences is not just the knowledge that you get um, and the people that you meet, but just overall, it excites teachers, and it re-energizes them. You know, as you look for the, you know, or towards the, the new year, which comes around really fast. Um, summers are short and quick these days. Mm. So you get so excited and, you know, you want to bring all this stuff back to your classroom the next year and share it with your students. And that's, that is just so worthwhile, just having, you know, being energized again like that. A lot of fun. We also have, um, so we're part of a, a STEM center at a university, and so there is, if you go to stemideas.org, um, which is the website for our STEM center, there's a list, there's actually a map of, uh, it says the international STEM community. So far we've got all uh, the U.S. locations that they've been able to find so far. So you may have a STEM center at a university near you. You can check mm -hmm. out that map. Uh, I'll post a link to that on the event page. Um, not all of them do teacher professional development. No, I was going to say that most of them do. Yeah, some are pretty. They have a link to something going on. Yep, absolutely. Um, I wanted to mention a couple of the even bigger um, full summer opportunities that I've I've seen come up. Um, I was a, an REU student way back in the day. That's research experience for undergraduates. Um, and there's a parallel program often funded by the National Science Foundation called RET, Research Experiences for Teachers. Um, and it's very similar to the RU program that you're paired up with a scientist and you get to work on a science research project. So I was working, gosh, my first one, where I first saw the RETs was when I was at MIT Haystack Radio Observatory <laughs> in New Hampshire, <laughs> where Pamela and I both have a, <laughs> a pedigree that goes back there. Um, there were several of us who were undergrads, and then there were several teachers who were all doing working on radio astronomy type research projects. Um, so the National Science Foundation runs those. Um, RETnetwork.org is a good place to find information about that. Um, and it will have information. Again, this is it's, they've already started for this summer, but they usually have an application process that it's the same as the RU, probably happens in winter for the next summer, so you can apply for that. Um, that, that'll that take care of your summer. You'll be doing research and you'll be able to bring that experience back mm -hmm. to your classroom when you go back in the fall. Um, yeah. So RET is a good, is, is a really good yeah, broad awesome. program on um, different types of sciences and yeah. in pretty much every state as well. <laughs> so you don't necessarily have to go far. But if you can travel, there you go. Uh, mm -hmm. If you're really into traveling far, uh, this is a, a program that came up during one of our previous shows when we talked to the Ice Cube people. There is a group called Polar Trek, T-R-E-C, Teachers and Researchers Exploring and Collaborating. You could spend time in Antarctica. How cool is that? 
Cool. <laughs> we are taking yeah. teachers down to Antarctica, um, and, and 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 the teachers are helping the scientists do research. Uh, so if you if you are particularly adventurous, um, mm -hmm. if you are particularly uh, not averse to cold, that's a possibility as well. Um, so check out that program, <clears throat> so you can spend some time. Um, Helping, helping uh, do research in Antarctica, and you can bring those experiences back to your classroom as well. Mm -hmm. uh, so that's Polar Trek. <coughs> Sorry, PolarTrek.com. Um, and you can still go to Space Camp if you're a oh, teacher. Oh, that's right. Yeah, so there's still Space Camp for Educators, and this is one I did a long time ago also. And it know. is very fun. Um, you get to do missions. Um, it's and if you're more familiar, some people might be more affili uh, familiar with regular um, the Challenger centers where you go mm -hmm. and you take your take your kids and and they'll do missions and learn lots of um, good space science and do activities and that's really um, the format for the teacher version as well. But again, you get to um, meet a lot of great fellow teachers. Um, you get put on teams where you're do doing different, doing like a shuttle mission, um, some sort of EVA type space mission, um, and then you know lots of great materials that you get. I got, I don't, mine's at home. You get this huge, huge three ring binder of stuff, which is another you know thing. Teachers love to get more activities and more ideas, so you can still do space camp for educators and have a blast over the summer pretending to be an astronaut. Yee! What fun. And uh, at basecamp.com they still are registering for the summer so you can you can still check that one out. Yeah. I, lo I love that. You're never too old for space camp. I saw that too and it's I've true. I've never been and, and that needs to be fixed. <laughs> <laughs> But yeah, the, the special special one for educators um, is available over the summer, so that's really cool. So what was space camp like? I'm jealous. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. You know, the coolest thing, you got to do some of the simulators. Um, you got to do a shuttle mission, so you got to be, um, you know, you would be assigned one of the, the crew members, and honestly, I think I was a co-pilot, but... I can't really remember. I remember trying to, yes, land the shuttle on one of our practice missions. And, you know, it didn't really go all that well, but um, it was still a lot of fun. Um, you also, you got to just do a lot of, like, sort of regular classroom activities. Um, and then the people that were also there were very gung-ho, you know, other teachers. And so you got to hang out and interact with them. Um, you got your own flight suit at the time. I don't know if they still do that, which is <gasps> awesome. And I still have mine. Um, you know, you just can't beat that. And uh, a lot of just great, fun people there. So I believe we stayed, I think it was a week. I don't know how long they are now. Yeah, I think Nancy Graziano. And it was, you know, and of course there's museums. I mean, there's places you get tours down there. Um, so, you know, that was all amazing, too. So for somebody who was just, you know, a space enthusiast, and, and at the time, of course, you know, the shuttle was still flying, and, and that was just amazing also. Nancy Graziano also said, anything, I want to go to space just, camp, so apparently she and I, are gonna, we're going to team up and go, because yeah, <laughs> we've never cool. been. <laughs> it's still really cool. Um, and, you know, again, this was, this. I went many years ago, so I can only imagine that, you know, Simulations and things have been upgraded in some sense that, you know, it's even more cool now. Now, if space isn't your thing, now, I think this would be, I've, I, I, I was at an uh, American Geophysical Union meeting one year, and I told Pamela, if this astronomy thing doesn't work out, I'm going to be an ocean researcher, because they get to research yeah. things, and that's cool. So, <laughs> there's uh, NOAA Teacher at Sea, that's teacher at sea.noaa.gov. You can spend one to three weeks on a research vessel. Um, all the, the research I hear about they do on these research vessels sounds so cool. I mean, you can, uh, they have a blog that follows all, all the teachers as they go. So it's, it's like I said, it's one to three weeks program. You can fit that in in the summer. Um, yeah. You can fit that yeah. in dur during a break uh, and actually d help researchers out on research vessels study things like microbes through sharks to fish to all the things in the <laughs> in the sea. 
Um, so that, that, that I think is, is a really cool opportunity as well because again you're helping the research and going to some fabulous new places uh, mm -hmm. and doing something yeah. super, super hands on. Um, and then uh, science teachers aboard research ships or STARS uh, mm -hmm. is another, is another uh, such program that lets you do research on, on a research vessel. But yeah, I totally want to go... Um, <laughs> go out to sea. Go out to sea. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to join uh, David Schiffman and, and Tag Sharks. <laughs> <laughs> Leave astronomy behind and go tag sharks. <laughs> wow. That does sound, that sounds amazing. That's some mm -hmm. more. I think I maybe with that in Antarctica, uh, you could call that like extreme professional development. <laughs> <laughs> you can. I mean, and there's, yeah, there's all kinds of stuff like that out there where you get that. It's and you know authentic. It's you're out there actually, you know, not in the classroom, but out on a boat, or <laughs> or at least in a really cool, like, simulator that would be similar to something, you know, like space camp that the astronauts would have used. So um, it's it's beyond, yeah, classroom learning, which is excellent. Guido yeah. says, so speaking of extreme, maybe Ex in, in a, only a few decades, space camp will really happen in space. Oh, yeah. About a few decades. That, that would be happen. Fun. That could definitely happen. You have to write a grant for that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, uh, there's a, uh, speaking of, of cost effective, one more thing I found was an article on Edutopia uh, about no cost summer travel for teachers. So there are different experiences. Um, and this, this particular article, again, I'll share the link that uh, tells you a little bit about the application process for the different programs that you might want to join. And then things like the Peace Corps, where you can. Um, you can serve a, a much shorter commu commitment, like a, mm -hmm. usually Peace Corps tour is two years, but teachers can do a, a shorter few months to a year commitment um, to uh, focus on education. So there are different ways that you can travel and really get to experience the world, um, and they also include the Teacher at Sea program, in ways that uh, you're giving back and, so, and helping out, whether you're a humanities teacher or a science teacher, um, these kind of opportunities um, are listed on this article, so I'll share that one as well. Uh, yeah, you know, most of these things are not free, unfortunately, um, you know, and depending on the size of them and the scale. Right. Um, but it's worth um, asking around and just start at your, you know, start at your uh, local school office and go to district and, and just keep asking, you know, because sometimes there are funding sources or there's a little bit of money over here and, you know, it's definitely worth asking. Um, and then just depending on how badly you want to do it, you know, it might be something that you save up for and use your own money. Well, um, the, the things like RET are funded by NSF or, or the NOA teacher right, is funded could, by NOA. There's funded some funding out there for them, yeah. So, so those, those programs are funded. You can just go to them. Some of them may even pay you a stipend. Um, I, I, I don't know how much the RET stipend was compared to the REU stipend, mm -hmm. um, but the, the, those the bigger national programs like that. That's why I think they, they, they they're more stable. They they come back every year because they have uh, bigger pots of funding, whereas some of the smaller ones they'll when the grant runs out it runs out and so they yeah. don't yes. get repeated. Mm -hmm. um, but for 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 the big research ones, um, I think a lot of them. You now of course you're going to have to worry about. You know, if, if you have a family that you're leaving for a couple months, or a household that you're leaving empty for a couple months, that that is another that is another issue. Uh, that was a lot easier to do when I was a college student because you get kicked out of the dorms in the summer. So what are you gonna do anyway? Oh, I gotta go somewhere. <laughs> Where can I go? Oh, yes. I see. Yes. Yeah. So, but uh, a lot of these these bigger trips, you don't necessarily have to buy. Space camp, I think you do have to pay for, um, but some of these large research trips, you don't. Um, they do have uh, funding opportunities. It, it depends program by program. And even like our, our professional development workshops, our week long, um, we have a stipend for teachers to come. And so that helps entice people to come and join us for a week. So they're not paying us. <laughs> we're, we're getting money from a grant to put on the workshop, and then we're giving them a stipend to help cover things like transportation, child care costs, you know, all, all of that stuff. Yeah, so there's, yeah, there's many different models out there for how these things keep running and run so um, but it, it definitely pays to ask and, and then the other thing too is it's not just a cool experience but a lot of them will give you um, some sort of graduate credit um, right. especially if they're somehow connected with the university and and a lot of them are 
um, or at least um, CPDUs, those things that all teachers need. Most of them seem to be for what? Oh, another great acronym. Um, <laughs> Continuing Professional Development Unit, I okay. think. <laughs> and you need so many of them, I forget how many, um, every year or for some period of time. Um, but you need them uh, yeah. to keep your certification or your licensure, which I think that's changed too. So lots of stuff to keep up on, but that, that kind of stuff um, is usually tagged on to a lot of these experiences. So. So you're covering some requirements in addition to doing something that is fun and good for you. <laughs> yes. Well, exactly. I know. The best of both. Awesome. Uh, any other things, that any other opportunities come to mind? I think I ran out of, out of my links. <laughs> uh, no, those are the biggies that I remember because they were just, again, they are just so much in line with my personal <laughs> interest. And I just figured, you know, I, even if you're kind of working, you got to do a little work over the summer, but for teachers, you know, that's the, the time to get a little me time. You know, you've been working like crazy for the whole year and helping the students and all that, and now the summer is, um, if not super relaxing anymore, at least it might be something that you, you know, is really tailored to your interests. Mm -hmm. I had more and more about what you like to do and learn about. I had a blast at the Terra Luna Teacher Professional Development last summer, <laughs> week long, because yeah. um, I've never been a, a school teacher, but uh, getting to talk one on one with the teachers about the science and working mm -hmm. with the, the educators that we have on the team, um, getting to watch them mentor these teachers and show them these new cool activities and bring it in the side. It was, it was just a really great experience. Um, yeah. And we're repeating it again in a couple of weeks for Investigate. Uh, we have like 20 people coming this time. I'm so excited. Uh, so I hope I hope we yeah. still get as, as much awesome. We have 20 people for a week. I'm sure there's going to be lots more one-on-one -on -one interactions. Um, yeah. So yeah. I get to learn a little bit, and they get to learn a little bit, and it, it's, it's a really, really cool time. So, yeah. yeah. Lots of good learning. Yes, all the learning. It, th that's yeah, that's the best part is seeing teachers who are passionate about the subject and about learning it and mm -hmm. learning what the new science is, the stuff that's not in their textbooks because the textbooks haven't caught up yet. We can right. add that, that that experience to their teaching. Right. Oh yeah, and then you know you and like our teachers, you know, become resources for. Mm -hmm. Or the participants later in the year, you know, they get into something, oh, yeah, they have a question, or you know, you could come and you know do Google Hangout in their classroom and actually talk to their kids. I mean, it's you know those kinds of relationships get going, and they're really um, fun and helpful. So it becomes a good resource, and that is you know that's some of the sustainability that right. happens. So that's adopt the scientists. Yeah. I would totally be adopted by a classroom. That would be great. <laughs> All right. I think that is it. I'm uh, going to check the uh, comments real quickly. Um, see if there's anything that we missed. Um, just more about space camp. Yes, there is adult space camp. I know. It's the money and the time and the stuff and the things. And that's there's nice. also like parent and child space camp, too. Oh. So, yeah, if you're a dad or mom and you want to go with your child. At least they used to have that, I should say. I think they still do. Awesome. Yes. Another version. Yeah. Family Space Camp. All right. Well, thank you guys so much for, for watching, for listening. Um, we Let's see. So today is being Wednesday. The Week the Space Hangout will be Friday. So I'll give you the run rundown of all the upcoming shows. Uh, Fraser Kane pulls together a bunch of space enthusiasts uh, together to talk about the top stories from the week. And, of course... This week is the American Astronomical Society meeting in Boston, so there's a lot of interesting press releases coming out from that meeting, so there'll be plenty of space news to talk about. In fact, I've been um, using the CosmoQuest uh, Twitter and Google Plus and Face, uh, uh, Twitter and Google Plus feeds to share some of the prettiest space pictures that have come out mm. this week, so you should check that out. Um, on Sunday, actually, I think the uh, virtual star party is moving to a monthly format rather than weekly. I know they've been having a lot of issues with weather, but <laughs> we are planning to do a monthly format, which uh, will not be canceled, even in case of inclement weather. They will build up some imagery throughout the month to show you in case everybody's clouded out like it has been lately. <laughs> so check out the virtual, the virtual star party. Yes, the virtual, virtual star party. So the virtual star party is moving to a new monthly format. Check out 
uh, Virtual Star Party on Google Plus for more about that. Um, Monday, Pamela will be back from traveling. I think she had back to back trips. Uh, so I think they'll be restarting Astronomy Cats on Monday. And then uh, next Wednesday, here on Learning Space, we'll be talking about a dark sky preserve in Portugal, Dark Sky Alqueva. Uh, so we will hear. So we'll go back to the dark skies thing we've been talking about, and and some right. ways that areas are preserving it, like the natural resource that it is. Uh, so that'll be next week's learning space, same time, same place. Um, I think that's it. Go learn things. Good. I know it's <laughs> summertime. Keep learning. Don't it's stop. Summertime. Keep learning. Well, okay. It's summertime in the northern hemisphere. Keep learning. <laughs> you can keep learning in the southern hemisphere, even though it's winter too. Very true. Very true. Global. All right. <laughs> Thanks so much, Georgia. I'll see everybody next week. Yep. Thanks. Bye. Bye. Oh. <laughs>